This is the Coming Home Podcast with John Allen. Can you hear me? Test, test. Oh, I can. Uh, uh, you can. I don't really I, I, need these, do I? As long as you, you're a musician, you know about know, mic distance. I know, I know, yeah. yeah, I know all yeah, about that. You're good. You're so good. as long as you're happy, I can hear you. I'm always happy, man. Look all at right. that. Smiling constantly. You don't look happy. I just wondering what was wrong with you. But, <laughs> <clears throat> and I found out you're American, so. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right. You're not afraid of talking politics, are you? No, 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 no. In fact, that's one of the things. It, let's just say we're starting the podcast. Okay, welcome everybody to the <laughs> welcome everybody to coming home with John Allen, the podcast and the radio program. If you're listening to me uh, on a podcast platform, please check the links in the description of the episode. That will show you where you can go if you'd like to support my work. My guest today is Mr. Martin Hello, Martin Hogfush. Hello. Hello, and thank Hello. you. you know, We've been I'm jabbing and blabbering and, and blabbering for for what. 20 minutes before we turn on the mics. But, yeah, uh, but right now I I just caught a sight of, um, I'm kind of intimidated by you, John, because... Smile uh, and all? Yeah, no, even Maybe with the smile, because I'm not looking the... at you right now. I'm looking at the three old suitcases with the with the handcuffs on top of them. Oh, I'm yeah. just wondering what's in the suitcases. Well... You haven't had any guests go missing, have you? Well, you see how old those suitcases are, so it's of crimes yeah. long oh, gone. Right, so okay. you're safe now. Okay, you're your safe. forefather's sins. <laughs> All right. Sins but the other the book father. here, which makes me makes me feel you know safe and and uh, and comfortable, is I'm looking over at a big red book in your bookshelf. There, it's right the under. It's right underneath the. Uh, I think it's The Simpsons. Is it The uh, Simpsons or is it The Looney Tunes? Anyhow, it's almost the same book. No, it gets a little bit. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, right. I studied Norge's law of it, and yeah. according to the law of Norway, those suitcases are allowed to be there, okay. contents included. All right. That's cool. <laughs> no, that, that right there is a, uh, the suitcases are Snoopy's. Okay. Uh, you can see how old they are. I believe her father used to own those. Yeah. And then the handcuffs, that's, uh, um, I don't know if you know, but that's, I was a police that's how officer. You, that's how you met her. I was a police officer back in the States. It has to do with an arrest and, oh. and, and, and uh, yeah, felonious um, acts by Snoopy. Um, okay. Yeah, she needed a favor, so here we are. So. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Who's the stand-up comedian? Is it me or you? Um, <laughs> I'm sitting down. Just, yeah, I'm, in sitting a, I'm in this uh, <laughs> really deep sofa here. We were talking... Um, we were talking before. I want to give my viewers and listeners a little background for why you're here. Uh, I told you the story uh, before the mic went hot uh, about how it's your music. And also, and I didn't tell you this, but it was also your political engagement that attracted me to you and got me interested in your story. And, you know, things being what they are, it took me 20 years <laughs> Before I actually, I think you and I, we, we've, I've changed, not, I've changed my name and my address about 50 times. So. I have, well, no, when I'm I came, joking. well, when I came here to Norway, yeah. we had a Hemily address. We had oh, a, really? a, a, oh, you a had secret had address and secret. Oh. Oh. Uh, okay. I don't want to, okay. I don't want to, I don't want to. It has to do with those suitcases. Okay. Okay. All right. to do with I don't, I don't want to know about them. But, um, uh, so, so almost from day one, you were, yeah. you're one of the first, um, public figures that I became interested in here in Norway, but it took me 20 years before we finally, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess it was maybe me who contacted you first on Instagram. Maybe uh, I wrote possibly. something yeah. something like that. But either way, I'm glad I that you I thought I met you on Tinder. <laughs> Grinder? I thought it was Grinder. actually. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> Tinder, Grinder. All right, sorry. <laughs> it ended in R. R. Yeah. Um, but you, um, you're quite the prolific musician. I mean... <sighs> Thank you for the gifts, some Christmas gifts here. And this is just a drop in the bucket of your musical works. Yeah, I, I, I tend to, uh, I've written a lot of songs. I'm a songwriter and it, it's never really, I've never really found it hard. You know, I've never like, well, I don't know what it is, but it's, I'm just lucky. It just, uh. I'm a songwriter more, you know, I'm, I feel more of a songwriter than a musician. I do a lot of uh, lyric writing for other artists and I, yeah. whatever. But yeah. Um, I don't want to sound like a fanboy, but your prolific songwriting, I, I, I said it was your prolific musicianship, but it was actually your songwriting. You right. know, uh, uh, my absolute favorite song by the Hellbillies, the original in English was written by you. And I see you have all kinds of different so you have a constellation of partners that you've worked with and yeah. different groups and whatnot. And I've always found that extremely 
uh, interesting when a songwriter can be that prolific. You don't only write for yourself in your own projects, but you're out there in other projects. And I've actually tried to mirror that. I have done it to a certain extent. I'm not up at uh, Martin Hogforsh level yet, but you are quite the inspiration for me as a songwriter. I can't believe I'm the only one in this country who's inspired by your songwriting. So Oh, hats off. Thank you. Hats yeah. off to you. Yeah, I, every once in a while, people do give me a call and they want yeah. to collaborate. And yeah. I always enjoy that. And uh, Do you always say yes? No, I don't. I, I don't do always you have say yes. Do you have to, a standard? <clears throat> not a standard. I, it's, uh, um, well, it is a sort of a standard. I mean, why? Do, what do they want? You know, uh, what do they want? I mean, if you're going to put words in people's mouth or if you're going to... Um, sit down and uh, collaborate over a melody or a lyric or whatever. Um, it has to be somebody who actually wants to say something, uh. or you know, has uh, or or has like kind of like their own touch, uh -huh. and it's uh, they've got to bring something to the table. Exactly. Um, just to get one thing straight here um, yeah. on that song that you were mentioning, which is that hellbilly song called Lidertha. I wrote the lyrics and only part of the melody um, that oh. we recorded for uh, in a band I uh, with the, the guitar player from uh, from Hellbilly, Lars Hovet Hergen, and uh, and uh, Håkon Gephardt. We were we called ourselves HGH. H -H, you yeah. know, we changed the name what the HGH uh, actually meant, but that was actually. <laughs> um, we kept that going for almost 15 years yeah. with uh, a lot of touring. But yeah, so that was, and that was called Excuses. It's a song I really like. and uh, Beautiful song. Thank you. Beautiful and, song. Uh, I've actually done it a couple of times. I did it with an Italian band. Did you uh, really? Yeah, I did it with them because I was on tour with them a few times all over Italy. And I also made a, uh, I did a recording of that song with, my friends in motorcycle that was back ah. when I was working with homegrown that homegrown was my band. We called the, uh, it was a little, it was a single release we called motor home and we did, uh -huh. we did country homegrown <laughs> motorcycle. No, 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 wait, wait, wait. I'm getting yeah. confused. Wait, wait, wait. Don't that be confused. Oh, no, this, that's the, you scared of my overarms. Had... Is that no, what it no, is? No, 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 no. Am I biceps <laughs> intimidated? <laughs> I think it's my age, you know, because now I started thinking, no, that wasn't the song we did then. That was another song called Country Chris, which was another, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't do excuses with Motorhome. That was a Country Chris. Mm, okay. <laughs> well, either way, it's a beautiful song. <clears throat> Thank you. And it deserves, you know, you're talking about collaborating with different artists yeah. on that one song. It deserves it. Yeah. It deserves to be expressed in that way. That's um, a funny thing, though, is that for so many years I was collaborating with um, with Lars Horvath, um, the guitar player, uh, Hergen, and uh, but then uh, they started a band. <clears throat> they started a, a band because I've always like kind of like you know uh, they've like. Bands kind of like you know Tom Petty and yeah. uh, and uh, maybe the Birds or yeah. or Burrito Brothers and that stuff and they started an English speaking band and um, <clears throat> they wanted and they hired a, like two or three English speaking songwriters to help them with the lyrics. Me and uh, Jeff Wasserman. <clears throat> Jeff Jeff doesn't live too far away. He lives over in oh, really? Sunvika. He's a great guy. Okay, you have him on your show. Jeff Wasserman. Yeah. And, uh, I'm writing that down. Yeah, do that. He's my buddy. And anyhow, they, they had this, uh, and I was trying to think, they wanted a band name, so I was thinking what to do. And I was driving my old Volvo. I like old Volvos. I was driving my old Volvo through the country countryside in Ustfall, and it dawned on me, to call the band the Respitexans. The Respitexans. Because, I mean... It's not called Respitex in the U.S. That's Formica, you know, but Norwegians won't get, get it. So right, exactly. They'll, <laughs> so they'll <laughs> understand. Since it's, it's an English name for <clears throat> a Norwegian-speaking audience. That uh, <clears throat> was some great work that you guys did. I have a CD from the Respitexans around here somewhere. Yeah. We've had some redesigning in my yeah. studio and out in the, in, the, yeah. in the house here. So I've 
I don't know where it is, yeah. but it's around here somewhere. I'm going to just rediscover it eventually. Yeah. There's a song I'm really, uh, I really like uh, from that <clears throat> first album of theirs, um, which uh, I happen to write the lyric to, uh, which <laughs> no. was called uh, The Dam. And it was about yes. this guy called uh, Amos Trapper Osborne, was the one in every crowd, fourth generation, independent, strong and proud. And it goes in, it, it's about this, uh, the, the dam up in the valley where, where his, you know, family home was. Anyhow, so that's that. I'm going to have a sip of coffee. Take a sip of coffee. <laughs> Take a sip of coffee. Um, let me ask you this, Martin. <clears throat> for every musician that I, well, I shouldn't say for every musician, but for myself, yeah. I can remember uh, that one moment where I decided I want to do something with music, whether it's writing, singing, performing. Mm. Do you have a moment like that? No. No. I don't. Um I've always liked, I've always been, you know, ever since I was really small, um, I was always like really hooked and listening to the radio and listening yeah. to songs. And, uh, and growing up, I, I was, you know, into music and played instruments. And as a teenager, I wrote tons of songs, but as it never, a teenager, yeah. yeah, but it never dawned on me. It never dawned on me. It was something I could make a living doing. Uh, so I have like no higher education or anything. I um, worked in psychiatric hospitals. I uh, worked carpentry. I did construction work. Yeah. I did lots of stuff until until uh, I was about 24. And then I'd been like working since I was 18. And then I um, I got a job. I was hired to start building... Um, constructing an oil platform and then i oh. thought you know and i said well <clears throat> i was I, I got into the point then that i said you know what i think i'd like to see if i can do something music related so so it wasn't I, a burning desire it's just it was kind well, of no it wasn't a burning desire because i've always been very pr pragmatic and i've always okay. i've always known that i have to make a living Right. I got to make money. Mm. I got to get by. And I didn't see myself. I mean, I didn't have any support, so I couldn't, you know. Yeah. That, that I mean, so that wouldn't happen. So, so it wasn't the cliched childhood with dreams of stardom and. No, no, no. Uh, you no, you no, had no, a very no. practical. No, I've always seen, and, and I never wanted to. Uh, and even after I got, <clears> you know, I gradually got into the music industry, I, uh, I never. I always just wanted to be a songwriter. And yeah, you mentioned that already. Yeah, yeah. you're most. You're more focused on the writing aspect. Yeah, but which I do love performing, background. and I know I'm pretty good at it. So, well, you're but, out there a lot, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But anyhow, so what happened was I started my. I got into the music business or entertainment is industry or whatever you want to call it by um, knocking on doors in Boston, and. Uh, going to PA companies, public address, sound, yeah. sound companies. And um, I eventually landed a job with Terry Hanley Audio Systems. Now, Terry Hanley is the youngest brother of, or the brother of Bill Hanley, and they had a sound company in the 60s together and the 70s, which was called Hanley Sound. Now, Hanley Sound... They did stuff like, and this is a very small company. Mm -hmm. Hanley Sound did Woodstock. They did Newport oh. Jazz Festival. Okay. If you ever, if you saw the, um, if you saw the documentary out now in the um, the Har the the Harlem. Uh, that, yes, the yes. big festival. I recognize. They call it the Black Woodstock. The yeah. Black Woodstock. Yeah. yeah. You know the the Har Harlem Cultural uh, yeah. Harlem Cultural Concert Series. I need to check. And that I out. looked at that, and I could see in the speakers. Oh yeah, I know those speakers. Uh, how you know, cool and is they, that? Yeah, and they, so they did all that stuff. I mean, they did like the you know they did the the Beatles in Shea Stadium. They did the Beach wow. Boys. They did lots of stuff, and uh, but they were not uh, business savvy. So okay. they split as you know. So Terry started his own company, which was called Terry Hanley Audio Systems. And I started working for him and I worked for him for uh, about two years until I got, um, I was asked to uh, go do sound at a local club in Cambridge, you know, right across oh. the river from Boston. And, um, and I did. And that was like, 
amazing. I started working this club where I did la- sound and lights. Yeah. You know, I was still a musician, but this is, you know, how what I was making this my, now? this is 1986, okay. 85. I started working there. 85, 86. I started working at this club, the night stage. And, uh, I got to do stuff like, I mean, I did, you know, Betty Carter, Astor Piazzolla. I did Tracy Chapman. Tracy I did, Chapman. Yeah. You know, I did just tons of yeah. stuff, you yeah. know? Um, and so it was seven nights a week, two shows a night. And, you know, I did Les Paul. Uh, oh, wow. Diz, yeah, did I say Dizzy Gillespie? Dizzy Gillespie, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, and w- <laughs> Wynton Marcellus and tons and tons of artists. And I was there for about two and a half years and then doing all these bands. And then I, um, my son was born yeah. and uh, was a Norwegian woman. And uh, we decided to move back to Norway. And one, just one thing here, John, because you're in Drummond, yeah. one guy from Drummond. And one, and the, a Norwegian musician came by called um, Jan Godbodek, the yeah. saxophone player. Yeah. He's very famous. And uh, he was on ECM Records and everything. And he asked me, and I asked him, hey, are there any sound companies in Norway? Because, mm. you know, now I, was, I had a family and yeah. I had to make a living. Yeah. She was a nurse. Uh, so she, you know, could make money, but, um, and he said, yeah, there's a company called drum and lead drum and lead. Yeah. So first thing I did when I got back to Norway is I, st- I called up drum and lead. And, uh, since then it's been through sound and publishing contracts as a songwriter. And then it, gradually I made enough money to phase out sound and studio work and live, you know, live sound. And gradually I made enough money. So the last 20 something years I've solely, you know, survived on being a songwriter and musician. Yeah. So, and that is a hard thing to do in Norway. Um, or maybe I'm just not doing it right. (laughs) No, it's a hard thing to do in Norway. And I think it's because it's such a small market. I think there, I think it takes an extra, grittiness it takes more guts to try and make it as a musician in norway than it does back in the states for example in the states i know of people who live in in chicago or maybe even cities not even that big they have no recording contract they don't want one but they can survive on gigging they're not even they're they're not even a writer they're just gigging yeah there's a market for that yeah um it's it's i don't see that here in norway no it's a weird thing um there's uh, audiences are normally kind of patriotic. So if True. you want to be, if you're on like a local level, you have to have a local place to come from. Right. So like the hellbillies that you mentioned, they started out and they built themselves up from where they were from. And a lot of the artists that you're probably talking about now, whatever city they're in, they're, you know, they have to build up a local following yeah, and that's important. And, the, and a lot of the successful bands in Norway are like that, yeah. you know, like you have <clears throat> the September when out in Stavanger and you yeah. have, you know, it's, it's all this local stuff going on. You know, some of the right. big bands on one side, on one coast aren't going to be big on the other coast. True. Yeah. So yeah. I found it a little bit difficult since I didn't have any roots. Yeah. You know, I don't have like a base. I ha- have no base. Uh, you know, because the local, <clears throat> the local press aren't going to write about you unless you're born and bred in in that local, you know, in that area. But you've you, <clears throat> you're legitimate, legitimately national. You're not yeah. a you're not a local guy. You're not a no, regional no, guy. You're I a national no, guy. I have. How, uh, so how did you? What's what's the key? Is there a key to breaking through that? Yeah, yeah. You've got to establish yourself locally. Yeah. Is it because you're you don't such have a, to? I'm just saying it's well, it's, it's, it's a helpful. path. It's, it's a helpful. pathway, yeah. yeah. But is it because you are um, you and you have been for quite some time very good at that collaboration thing as a writer? Is that what has made you an international figure? I'm sorry, a national. Well, international actually, yeah. but a national figure here in Norway. Is that what did it? Your collaborations. Yes, I think yeah. it is. Um, a lot of I was kind of lucky in some ways. Um, pretty early in my recording career after only like six albums, yeah. uh, a bunch of musicians went together and they wanted me to record a, 
a, uh, a best of album with the homegrown band I was, I had. And so all these, you know, really great musicians from different bands, they all got together and, uh, they basically was kind of like a tribute to me. Yeah. And I thought it was really weird cause I wasn't dead yet. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So, you know? We, so we played, we started playing, and, we, and the album was actually called Cream of the Crop. <clears throat> and um, and uh, that band became, was really, became pretty popular. I yeah. mean, as a, as a live touring band. Yeah. So we played, you know, festivals from Northern Norway down to, you know, all over the, all over Norway. And we, Lars Hovind, Hellbillies was in there with on guitar. And, you keep mentioning and, his name. And, I'm going to tell you a story. Motor, and the motor, you know. The I'm going to tell you a story yeah. about him before we're finished. So it was Yaga Assist, Motorcycle, Hellbillies, yeah. and and, yeah. uh, and people from different bands. Oskil Holm was what, there. What year was that album? Um, 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 uh, 2002 or three, three maybe? It was right around when I came. Yeah, yeah I do yeah. believe I have that in my collection. And that was a really I, stupid thing to do that we started touring because that was kind of like a really stupid thing from the band that we were, <laughs> the band I was recording with, which was Homegrown. So you think it took attention away from yeah. your heart project? It was a your, lot your, of, but it was a lot of fun. Well, now you did this, this was like a, an homage to you after six albums. Yeah. Um, and you said only, like almost in air quotes, only six albums. Uh -huh. Now these days, six albums, you're almost a classic musician. You know, yeah, th yeah. you're almost an old timer. And that's because most musicians are just a flash in the pan. Mm. What have you seen in the music business that has changed the most to where... You know, what, what is the reason for uh, it being so difficult to break through and why don't record companies have the patience that they used to have before they would give you time to develop? Uh, you, you could release five or six albums and maybe on that fifth or sixth album is when you really broke through. They don't tolerate they don't really today. make, uh, they really don't make any money on, on new acts. <clears throat> the record labels now are making a shitload of money. Uh, due to their the um, percentages they acquire from the streaming <clears throat> and the back catalogs, and uh, they don't really need to build up new artists. They're, you know, they're they want to build, they want hits on the first album yeah. or two, yeah. and uh, and probably you know not have more than you know three albums max for for an artist. I don't know, but uh, what you see is. Um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, the, the industry has changed quite a bit. There's money in, still money in touring. There's no money whatsoever in making your own music and releasing it. Um, you can't make any money doing that. You have that. to get on the road. You if you're going to gonna make a living, you've got to be on the road. Yeah. Or get on the radio. And unfortunately, um. Well, that's not easy to do. No, it's not. And now that they've, you know, the last I don't know, like the last 10, 15 years have been formatting the radio. So they have like a, this, uh, they have kind of a, like a loop of songs that keeps on going and they're not that many independent um, DJs that are on the airwaves that can choose their own music. Uh, so you nailed it right there. Yeah. And that's, I just have to cut in and say this because I'm 10 broadcasts into my radio show and I still can't, but I shouldn't say this out loud. The boss might, <laughs> you know, kind of reel me in, but I still can't believe that I'm allowed to play whatever music I want and say whatever I want on the microphone right. for my radio show. I right. can't believe it. Yeah. Knowing the way the music business and the radio business, that, that evil cahoots that they're in, yeah. that pretty much closes the door well, on new talent. It's kind of like formatted in a weird way. They, it is. Um, the, I, you know, a lot of this stuff too, I mean, my music in one way is kind of retro, but I try not to, I try not to write stuff. I try not to s sound like something I've heard before. That's the thing. You're e even, even in what you're doing, even if it might have an organic feel or whatever you're doing, I'm yeah. still trying to find, make it sound original, at least yes. in my ears. Now <clears throat> I look at, if you look at the, um, if you look at, what you have to listen to when you go into a restaurant, when you walk into um, a clothes store, yeah. if you turn on the radio, yeah. um, and this goes for almost every country, 
you know, how many, I mean, you, you want, like in the U S too, it's like, it's, 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 I get nauseous sometimes listening <laughs> to the crap they, they're playing yeah. because one thing is I look at the, uh, I look at the classic rock format, which is like the soundtrack of commercialized just about anything is basically a straight jacket. I mean, <laughs> they're playing, st they're playing music that when it was written, uh, when the who wrote my generation yeah. or, you know, when Wilson Pickett was, uh, you know, was out there doing the midnight mover or, you know, when, when stuff was, or Sly and the family stone and all that stuff, it was cutting edge to them at the time. Yeah. And now 40, 40 years later, we're regenerating a uh, free bird and we're, and we're yeah. listening to like, you know, just the main hits of all these, of all these old bands and, you know, just taking, you know, the really lightweight stuff out of the Motown bag and all this stuff here. And it's just kind of like, these are like the 300 songs that are on heavy rotation all around the world, be it in restaurants, be it on radio stations, be it, you know, be it in, on ads on the TV or anything. And, it's kind of like, it's almost impossible. Well, it's very, very difficult to get newly written independent music played. Yeah. One thing that I have made um, a very conscious effort to do, uh, like I said, I'm only 10 broadcasts in, but coming up, um, you see my studio here on the other side of the camera from where my viewers are watching. There's plenty of room. I'm going to have some acts come in here, you know, bands with four, maybe five members or maybe some solo acts. I've already booked a solo guy who's going to come in here and perform acoustically. I'm going to do everything I can to push that out there to people and let them know that there is another type of music out there. It's not just what you hear in the radio. That's not the only thing that right. counts. In fact, quite the opposite. I will say that a lot of the things that you do not hear are 10 times better than what you do here on the radio. I'm not afraid to say that. And I'm not afraid to push that kind of music out right. there. I feel like I have a platform and I feel like I want to use it for yeah. among other things, that purpose right there. Mm. So to hear you say that, you know, when you think classic rock, people think, yeah, we're going to hear something that we don't hear normally. Well, yes, you are. You do normally hear it because classic rock has been boxed into this set, right. you know, this playlist of a couple hundred, maybe 300 songs. And that's all you're going to hear. Yeah. And, you know, so it's, uh, that's a little bit of the frustrating part is it's that, very frustrating. you know, it's, it's, it's different from, that's one of the changes you've seen is that the, um, getting original music out there, unless it's a fad. And also the, uh, <clears throat> this goes for anything. I mean, goes for, for your visibility, for my visibility. Yeah. Um, I just basically, uh, you know, that we have to sell something b besides the music. I mean, if I go into a, uh, uh, it's been a few years now since I'm uh, the age I am, but uh, you're not I, that I, old. Come no, on, no, man. but when I <laughs> when no when going into like Petra on the and yeah. NRK Petra, yeah. which is you know they have their segment. They're they're like just working. You know they just want you know from the twenty four to the thirty two and a half uh, segment or whatever. Yeah. And uh, and what they want you to do when you have new music, a new album, they want you to choose a cover song to play. Yeah. And and that yeah. it goes and that is like all over the place. Every time every time they're going to invite a musician in there, you might if you're lucky be able to play one of your own original yeah. new songs, but most likely they'd prefer to have you do some cover song. Now and, I, and with all the way, excuse me, but you know sure, like sure. all these you know, like on TV, they have uh, you know it's it's it's, you know, social pornography. It just oh, yeah. drives me crazy. Yeah, yeah. It drives me crazy. Well, you it's garbage is what it is. You can't shut up and just release your music. It's, it's garbage. And, you know, I would like to see a guy like you or me have that kind of a platform. Uh, and the bosses of that platform, the owners, if you will, have the balls to let guys like you and me put out there what we think people want to hear because you know yeah. what it is what people want to hear we're just normal guys well that could that but i think people <clears throat> i think if people are i know i'm getting this response on my radio show because i'm playing things that are far from what you're going to hear anywhere else and people are saying to me oh my gosh 
you know, that kind of music exists or, oh my gosh, I knew about that, but I never thought I'd hear on the radio. Oh my, you know, so I think that people like you and I, normal people, there's nothing special about us. We're just normal people. We know what's good. Why can't we get, why can't we be fed what is good through television or through radio? Is it all about money or is the ruling class in the entertainment business truly ignorant of what is quality? I think, you know, even the, um, or is it a combination? Even, even the, like the, uh, the, Norwegian equivalent of like, you know, national public radio or broadcasting or anything. They're, they're also, um, they're kind of like slaves to new public management where, uh, where they have to, um, they have to, they have to get a certain percentage of the listeners to listen, to, to listen that. to their stuff. And therefore, uh, and everybody's afraid to lose listeners. So, like NRK, uh, you know, PN is yeah. sounding more and more like NRK, <laughs> no, or like Pear Theater or it all do know it again and yeah. all these things. And these are all, and, and the, the two former ones that I mentioned, uh, like uh, Pear Feet and, and uh, whatever, uh, they, they will never try to break new music. See, that's their, that is their policy. They will not try to break right. new music. But um, that's the that part has I don't, to already have a certain amount of success before they're going to play it. Yeah, but see, that's the part that I don't understand because I, maybe I'm naive, but I truly believe that most people out there, if they turn on their radio dial or their television set and they see something outside of what they normally see, yeah. at the very least, they're going to be curious. Yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Where are the leaders of these entertainment platforms? Where are their balls? Well, kind of, yeah. Where's their guts to dare to do something different? Because I think... I don't know that people are aware of it consciously, but I do know that I, I, I believe that people would respond to yeah. something new, a new type of music, a new artist, a new band. Yeah, well, I think, well, you know, it's, it's a weird thing. And uh, we're actually, I'm trying to answer the question you asked, what has changed in the, in the business? And there's also an, another factor <clears throat> where um, there used to be a lot of more, a lot more music magazines, you mm -hmm. know, like, They'd have like you know yeah. like you know uh, equivalent to the to the English Melody Maker or yeah. you know et cetera et cetera, and uh, as uh, as the physical newspapers are losing ground, um, the first people they get rid of are the uh, are the uh, you know is the cultural uh, you know <sighs> journalists, and um, so there's a lot less there's a lot less space for new music to be. Um, for people to become familiar with it and start checking out new bands and stuff. And I don't want to come across, <clears throat> I really don't want to come across as being bitter. No, no. I'm a pr pragmatic person. And this, and this has kind of like led to there, you know, the things you do for your own sanity and yeah. for wanting to continue doing what you're doing. I mean, work is like a marriage too. There, yeah. there are things you want to do to make it work out. And, um, so I've just like, I've made some like choices yeah. to not, you know, just to keep on being playful and not getting <laughs> bitter and not misliking what I'm doing. So and my choices have been out of frustration, a little bit out of frustration, I guess at, at one point I'm. I'm not a consumer of uh, of television. I haven't had a TV for over 20 something years. Why doesn't that surprise <laughs> me? I think that fits so much with your persona. No, I mean I mean that. I just it don't does. because it just it, it got to the point where it was it's kind of like this cycle yeah. that what you read in the newspaper um, if it was a, you know, if what you read in the newspaper was something that had just been on TV yeah. and it started, it was kind of like this turbulent thing going yeah. and, uh, and this, and if it wasn't really anything that interests you, I thought it, well, you know, it feels a lot better just to search out my own sources of information and, yeah. you know, where do I want to get my news? Um, so that's one, one thing I, I started doing. And another thing was, um, uh, this was slightly out of frustration um, <clears throat> after releasing, you know, like probably uh, it was like 19 albums of my own music um, to a grown up audience. I decided, wait a minute. I really like I started I, I'd started doing children's music. Well, 
I mean, I wrote my own songs and I played them to kids. Yeah. And, and that was news I, to me. You told me that on the phone the yeah, other day. I and, didn't, I and, didn't and, uh, I just thought, Oh, this is great. A, um, I love them. They're a sober, attentive audience. You, you said know? that, yeah. And, and that's, and, and, you know, I just really enjoy kids. I really do enjoy kids. And, you know, I think I've always liked kids. Yeah. I got, I'm a grandfather now. Are you? Yeah. 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 And, you know, I, I, I picked him up in Barnahava an hour, an hour and a half ago. Ah, yeah. So, uh, but you know, so kids are great. I love kids, uh, but I also enjoy entertaining them. And, you know, it's so playful. And um, the beauty of doing, I found out the beauty of, because uh, I played live for kids through uh, the school system. <clears throat> Did that for several years until I decided, you know what? Maybe I should like record an album of, of new new written material. I thought it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Really, is, is to is to really? write the write new songs, <clears throat> new material for kids. Yeah, and uh, and I was really like really scared that wow this is going to be difficult. And I, I seemed to I did a pretty good job. Me and uh, my partner back then that we released two albums together for kids, and um, and. Uh, and it just became like, whoa, I prefer this to the Martin Hagfor solo albums or the homegrown really? albums. You prefer yes. that? Yes. And I, That's very I made, interesting. I made, I made a, and I made a choice. I gave myself, I, I fired myself. I quit my bands. I, you know, I stopped playing with Homegrown and HGH and Cream of the Crop and all that. And I decided this is what I want to do. And I have this project <clears throat> which I called Mayo Kamaratman, which was actually taken from an old HGH song, which I called Me and My Buddy. And um, a little sip of coffee here. And I must be talking too much. No, and, uh, no. I love it. And, I'm, and, and I'm so, fascinated. Yeah. yeah, and so I decided, you know, the beauty of doing children's music is A, I never have, a, I never have to pitch a song to the radio and call radio stations and uh, find out what's going on because they'll never playlist a song that is so-called children's music. Right. So that that aggravation is gone. What a burden to not have yeah, to carry any it's, longer. It's great. It's great. You'll never have a hit. So that's perfect. And I thought, okay, so I can continue doing this. Secondly, um, I have been very lucky. Um, and... Uh, as opposed to probably like 90% or 95% of any album released in this country mm -hmm. <clears throat> for children, they'll probably never get a review. Uh -huh. um, luckily from being who I am and the track record I've had and my, you know, the, my collaborators, um, my old collaborator with Hawk and Gephardt and the last six years, it's been Eric Johannesson. Um, we do get reviews yeah, and, uh, Excellent reviews. And um, so, but I don't have to, I don't have to like, f you don't feel like you have to front it. And I, I, I right. can also erase myself. I'm not, I'm not selling the soap with my name in it. Right. Martin right. Hagforce. I'm yeah. not doing that. Yeah. Now I just call myself Mai. Mai. And <laughs> uh, on our English, we released an, an album in English recently um, where, you know, what to do next. Every album has to be different. So, yeah. Yeah. We decided uh, uh, we did one. Uh, we did one album uh, uh, with um, where I had this idea. Or we had an idea, or I had an idea. We had this idea that um, you know, like if you listen to like Pet Sounds with the Beach Boys, yeah. And a lot of times, people have been writing writing music for and using symphony orchestras, yeah. But trying to trying to get a, uh, a pop rhythm section, drums and bass, which you have your, you know, you have your, you have your dr tight groove, yeah. tighter groove. And then you want to, and then you want an add in symphony orchestra to that. It's, it, it's always kind of like, it's not really there. So we decided to make a new kind of, right, new kind of music where we wrote, well, I guess we had like 12, 13 pop songs <clears throat> and arranged them totally for, symphony orchestra so 
I didn't play a I didn't play a note. I was just a singer. And uh, oh, that's different for yeah, you. Yeah. yeah. And that was great. And that was oh, well, that was cool. And then uh, we decided, well, you know what? I started looking around the internet and I said, you know, I don't really see any anywhere in the world anybody's doing that. Yeah. Uh, so we decided to uh, release an album in English, uh, which we called New Orchestral Hits for Kids. And when did that come out? <clears throat> Three years ago, four Three years, years ago. ago. Yeah. And that was really cool because um, we got it out on Noxus, which is the world's largest uh, classical label. But of course, I mean, they're kind of like, you know, they're kind of like purists and uh, they don't realize that, you know, we're, they're not listening to, uh, you know, Peter and the Wolf or anything like that. This is like songs that we've written and, uh, holding it up for the camera. They oh can, yeah. New orchestral hits for kids. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so that, you know, there's, uh, so we did that and that was something new. And then, uh, so every time so you recreated yourself, you dropped your Martin Hogforce yeah. persona. Yeah. I fired if you him. Can use that word. I fired he's him. He's gone. He's yeah, he's, he's, he's dead meat. Got rid of him. <laughs> but, but, Okay, but that persona, Martin Hogfush, can he perform for children? Or is it just... No, it's my. my. It's just my. Yeah. Martin Hogfush cannot perform. That's not yeah. him. That's not his gig. No. It's my. My. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I love it. Yeah. So... So... Let me, let me, back, let me back up a little bit. Well, actually, um, we're doing a show this on Wednesday, next week in Oslo. It's just, uh, just for, you know, once again, to do something else, um, <clears throat> we're doing a multimedia show, um, with my own comment off the men, but not for kids, but not for kids. <laughs> <laughs> Are we talking split personality here? No. <laughs> but I do want to ask you this now, mm. let's back up to when you decided to start performing mm. for kids. Mm. Uh, you said something to me on the phone the other day about how there was practically no interruption in your gig schedule. You performed pretty much straight through. Yeah, we were doing school uh, during the, uh, the, the worst of the previous, uh, <laughs> worst of the pandemics. Uh, um, we, did, uh, a f we did manage to do quite a lot of shows. Yeah. But we were doing like gymnasiums with only two classes instead of uh, 10 classes. Okay. You know? Yeah. So... So that, that to not have your schedule interrupted to any large degree because of Corona, you are a one in a million musician because most musicians here in Norway struggled severely. Yeah. But we did, no, we did really, we did pretty well. I mean, yeah. there was a few months we had to, everything was shut down yeah. and they didn't yeah. dare have anyone on the road. But um, right. then we went ahead and, um, the beauty of Norway is you can apply for grants for different yeah. stuff. <clears throat> and that we terrible apply. socialism that they keep talking about in America. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> oh, I, and, I, uh, I, yeah. I wouldn't want to give up uh, the benefits of living here in Norway. No, I just no, wouldn't. No, no. Yeah. Ask me what the, how much we have to pay each month for my mom in a home um, in the States. Anyhow, um, so we well, made this, we that. made, we made, we made this, um, I do want to go back project. to your time in the States. I just want yeah. to let you know okay. before we're finished, I want to talk about that. Yeah. I'm going to read you now. Um, but we made this project where we, uh, you know, we wanted to think of something new to do. And that was, I had this idea where, um, you could make it like an online mixer. Ah, huh. and, uh, that the kids could use with um, on their iPhones or their iPads or their Androids or yeah. their PCs. Yeah. And so we got this guy, a developer. We actually spent quite a lot of time trying to find a developer. <clears throat> Found this English composer and uh, tech nerd. And uh, that didn't work out. And then we tried a couple of other you know, had another a few leads out. And lo and behold, we found this uh, really great guy here in Norway who could do it. And uh, it was basically to write code. Um, so what he did was we gave him, I guess there were around eight tracks, like, and this was one of the songs we do with the band and a symphony orchestra. 
and uh, so that we could take the strings and the horns down, and or, or we had a well, you know one track for the strings and the horns, and bass, and guitar and piano together, and then uh, backing vocals on one track, and then my vocals on one track. Yeah. And what they could do then was, and then some funny sounds, <clears throat> you know, was psychedelic weird yeah, stuff. Yeah. And uh, so they could like make their own mixes of our songs, so how kids cool. could understand how this works. How cool without, is that? Without yeah. having to like download a program or do yeah. anything like that it's all operated through the web uh, you know like you know f whatever that's uh, very cool yeah. yeah and got a really nice special red button oh and yeah the red button is <laughs> they could record their own voice or or whatever you know the microphone in the mix yeah their voice or finger you know they could yeah. hit claps or whatever yeah. they want to do and so that was a project we worked on quite a bit. So that also kept us busy during our downtime. Now, is this available to the general public? Yeah, now? just go into myokamadatmindotenu, <clears throat> which is our homepage. Spell, it, out, spell come it for the non-Norwegian listeners. All right. Well, kamerat is like comrade, but um, of course we made a point of spelling it wrong. To, to uh, we Did put you? two 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 m's in it, so it's a k a m e r. Com, no, wait, wait. K A M M come E R two M's. Yeah. A T E N. So that's Kameraten. Min M I N. Min Dotenu. Yeah. And then my og. It's M E G O G for those non-Norwegian. Yeah. <clears throat> so that my is available. My, that is just yeah. available out there for kids yeah, to mess around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and think, for adults. Well, it's I was great just gonna, for adults. I, I was just going to say it's it's yeah. it's for anybody who is yeah. curious about that process in music. Is yeah. you know for sometimes I forget this if if you're not a musician all that stuff is just mystery exactly. to people how we do that. And we also have this button where I wanted you know I really like delays you know yeah, and yeah. echo so yeah. there, you can push a button and get the yeah. echo going and you can how pan cool. it you can pan it left right. I'm gonna check that. I'm gonna. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna get my kids yeah. hip to that. Yeah. We have a uh, 16 year old and a yeah. 14 year old, so yeah. Yeah. they're they're, and they're both interested yeah. in music. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Okay. Let me back up. Um, <laughs> there's a little bit to unpack here. Um, you have an American past. You're you're here in Norway now. You are Norwegian. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Okay. I have this. Yeah. You have you had at one point one foot in each country. Can yes. you tell us about that? Well, now I have like both feet in in, in Norway uh, by choice. Um, looking back, I really didn't live that long in the U.S. I was born there, um, California, correct? Yeah, I was born in California, um, and I, as a as a kid growing up, uh, my father was a scientist in a, in astronomy, and we moved around, so we were in like. We were in Peru, we were in Puerto Rico, uh, Norway, of course, different places in the U.S. But I've always kind of felt like, you know, the place I feel most at home in the U.S. was where I spent most of my formative years, and that was in the Boston area. But uh, <clears throat> as of today, I have three siblings. They all live in California. None yeah. of them were born there. I was born there. Uh, and my mom lives there. And uh, yeah. my father passed away after in in actually passed away in Puerto Rico. Oh. He was living in Germany, though. So, I mean, it's kind of like no root situation. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, I came to Norway the first time my teen, as a teen, and I went back to the States for only about four years. And it's, your, an it's your mother who <clears throat> is... My mother Norwegian. is British. Your mother is British. I think she's got a U.S. passport now. I can't remember. <clears throat> yeah. So, so then, so, okay. So, where's the where's the Norway connection then? Where does my that, father was Norwegian. Your father was Norwegian. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. but he became a naturalized American. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So that's it. So yeah. So I have a uh, I have Norwegian blood. I have uh, English blood. So when did it <clears throat> uh, fall into place for you that Norwegian was going to be your home? I'm sorry, that Norway was going to be your home and not the United <clears throat> States. Well. It was when my son was born in the States um, and his, uh, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, it was, uh, we made the choice to move to Norway. Yeah. So, but at the time I didn't want to. Oh, let's <clears throat> talk about that. 
<laughs> what is it with these ladies dragging uh, American men across borders into Norway? No, I came here uh, not unwillingly. I'll, I'll put yeah. it to you that way. But was it? I don't uh, regret it now. Looking back. Well, you're certainly doing well now. Yeah, I'm doing. I'm know. doing great here. But I, you know, it's doing pretty good in the states. And um, but at the time, you were a little ugh, Norway. Yeah, I didn't really didn't want to go back to Norway. Yeah. Um, but uh, I did, and uh, now I'm I'm happy I did. Yeah. Uh, especially seeing what a mess the U.S. is. You know? When do you think that mess <clears throat> started? Lack. I. Well, when did it when, start? What were the main catalysts for the <laughs> the breakdown of all things America? When did that start? When everybody has a different view on that. Some people take the easy way out and say, "Well, it all went bad with Trump." No, but I, I think, think that's it, too easy to say. Yeah, I think. Um, well, the Vietnam War was a mess, and then that was a mess there were several things i mean i'm not a politician and i'm not no. a uh, i'm not a you know a, i'm not a brilliant person when it comes to looking at, at these things but i do believe that one of the worst things <clears throat> probably that happened was the after the um democrats um chose george mcgovern to be their presidential candidate and then, uh, and uh, he lost by a landslide, except for one state, which was <clears throat> Massachusetts. Mm. <clears throat> and you could get bumper stickers where it said, don't blame me, I'm from Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when they started with the superdelegates. Yeah. So I'll when never they, understand when, that. So no, I, don't, I just don't get that. Okay, well, so they have superdelegates, which means they'll never have, that is basically, that is what happened, that is why Bernie Sanders did not become their presidential, their, their candidate. It's one of the most undemocratic aspects of American politics. Yeah, so you have that. Um, that is one thing that really started going downhill. Yeah. Um, and deregulation of uh, the banking system. Uh, in the U.S. Early 80s with Reagan. Yeah. And uh, other things that have gone wrong is that they have, um, one thing is the infrastructure. Another thing is, <clears throat> they, you know, another thing in the U.S. is that they, uh, the school system, the public school system um, got pretty, you know, they didn't put the kind of money they should put into the public school school system. Well, it's so unevenly, uh, it's such an yeah. uneven tax uh, income. Yeah. But, you know, you have a poor area, which is a low tax income for that area, yeah. which means you get a shitty school. Yeah. That's where you're going to find all your anti vaxxers And again, back to what I said, it's one of the most undemocratic aspects of American yeah. society, yeah. that right there with the and school the system. And the big money, and the big money, especially the big money that went into um, health service. Yes. And, uh, and that they started- Thank the, God we're here in Norway. Yeah. Exactly. Me, I don't know if you've noticed or seen my Instagram. This arm is pretty dead. I've had, I think it was nine shoulder surgeries since uh, 2015. Uh, I would be homeless or would. would have committed suicide by yeah, now yeah. in the States with the healthcare system yeah. and bankruptcy and all that yeah. stuff. Thank God I'm here in Norway, happily paying my higher taxes, which really aren't that much higher. They're not higher. They're not. They're not higher. When you look at things, it is, it's, it's. It's that much higher. You can't even see. Can you see that on the camera? It's about but that then, much higher. But then, you know, and it's all, all, the, all the loopholes, all yeah, the millionaires. Yeah. It's like that in Norway, too. Yeah. Norway's, sure, been, Norway's sure. been going the wrong way. Sure. But sure. <laughs> it hasn't gone that far yet. So there are many things. Um, uh, there are many things that have been, uh, oh, yeah, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm a political person. Well, you most uh, certainly are. That's one of the things that made me uh, quite interested in you when I first came here. You were very often in the newspapers. I think I can remember seeing you on a couple of debate programs. Am I wrong? Yeah, I've done that, yeah. Back in those days. And, and I'm like, wow, what a well-rounded guy. I, am I kissing your ass? No, no, but, no, but, no, but, no. But, but I, I mean, it really, a lot it really of people made say me musicians you. And, and, you know, they should shut up. But I don't uh, believe that. I don't. Everybody has a voice. And sometimes yeah. musicians <clears throat> have a better, a more informed voice. Yeah. We have that sense of curiosity. We have that sense where we know when to shut the hell up and listen and observe. Yeah. And then we know how to do something with our observations. Yeah, I was, I was like totally, I, was, I remember I was on tour. I mean, yeah, there's so many things we could talk about the U.S., but <clears throat> when you started seeing, um, when you started having Bush get, get ourselves involved 
get ourselves involved in the first Gulf War <clears throat> and then the second yeah. Gulf War. I couldn't believe it. I could not believe how stupid they were. So I wrote a song called Blood for Oil. I mean, you know, it's blood for oil on sandy soil. Um, uh, for oil on sandy soil. Oh, I can't remember. Oh, you're better right than now. me if you yeah, can yeah, remember yeah, your yeah. own lyrics. But I, I knew, I knew another one. You know, so I had this, this <laughs> you know, the, the man on the throne got dressed up to deliver his victory speech, dressed as a pilot on a carrier. I saw it off Malibu Beach. You know, hello, G.W. Bush. <clears throat> yes, you know, and I wrote, I wrote a song about Norway too. I actually um, played it at a, at a, at a um, I was hired by the young, uh, the young labor. Uh, party, uh, which they call uh, uh, yeah, what, what they call themselves, RF, Arbeidens Ungdomsfilting. And uh, I remember playing this song um, for uh, Jens Stoltenberg, who was uh, when he was uh, the young sensation, the young sensation yeah. uh, who who became the leader of NATO. And uh, I started the song by playing uh, the Star Spangled Banner with a kazoo through my ah. nose. <laughs> <laughs> me, 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 have, have a me. seat, Jimmy Hendrix. Yeah. Here comes Martin you know, Hogfors yeah. with a kazoo. <laughs> and then I wrote this song, which, you know, it's just because, you know, we have uh, Norway's always yeah. been, to, I mean, no, Norway's a, a country of, just like all countries, I guess, but, I mean, but you have to see it. They're a bunch yeah. of hypocrites when yeah. it comes to, you know, weapon sales and whatnot. Right down and the I street wrote this in song. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, so I wrote, I feel, uh, I feel so proud to live in a land that drops your bombs in Afghanistan, that blows off the feet and blows off the hands of the kids <laughs> that play in Afghanistan. Afghanistan, Afghanistan. You might get lucky if you want to die because a plane might drop, uh, a bomb might drop from the planes we fly. A bullet might hit in silver and gold. Um, oh, I can't remember that one, but the next one is good. Is that If you don't want to go and you hunger strike, we'll drag you by the hair on the very next flight. We'll offer you a meal in celluloid wrap, and if the light turns green, you can take a crap on Afghanistan. <laughs> you know, and what happened then was that <clears throat> I was <clears throat> I wrote that song because in support to the um, to the um, hunger striking Afghans outside the uh, church in uh, the main church in um, uh, one of the main churches in Oslo. I remember that, and uh, so I wrote that, and that's the song I played for Jens. And he did not, I mean, he didn't smile whatsoever. And there's a lot of humor and it's kind of my Woody Guthrie style there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? no, I, I like your lyrics, man. You're a witty lyricist. You don't, um, you don't, there's no filler no, in your it, lyrics. No, it's, it's also, you know, if you want to get political and you want to get really political, yeah. I feel you have to do it. Um, but first of all, it has to be lyrically it is strong. Yeah. And secondly, you can use humor. Sure. Sure. Like Zappa said, does humor belong in music? Yes, it does. Absolutely. It belongs you know? in life, period. <clears throat> right, yeah. right. I try to inject um, humor in everything I do. I mean, it keeps me it keeps me going. Yeah. It's yeah. in the face of adversity. I have to laugh sometimes, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, we all do. Yeah, yeah, we all yeah, do. Yeah. Um so so you're not afraid of of being political. You're not afraid of talking about issues. Like I said, I can remember when I first came here, you were uh, all over the newspapers, uh, television, or whatnot, speaking on political things. Have you um, have you ever been faced with that person that tells you to shut up because you're oh, a yeah, musician? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, do you, how do you handle that? I'd ignore it. You won't even engage them in a discussion about why you're speaking. Well, it depends. I mean, are you are you air quotes using your platform? Well, I mean, I and then do you do you do you put words on that so people understand where you're coming from? Yeah, I was more into, I, I guess I did more stuff on the internet before, but after you kind of see the, um, you know, kind of like the climate, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. I bother, Yeah, unfortunately. I'll tell you why I bother, uh, because I can't, for, for a long time, uh, uh, I just didn't get involved, Right, uh, but I was an observer. Right. So I guess I was involved in my observations, but I wasn't vocal. I was not a vocal uh, 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 person in that whole social political debate. And that was frustrating to just be quiet. And I, f I felt like I was letting some people down. Um, first with my family, my kids. My kids are going to have to grow up in this world. Why should I not do the little that I can, I'm not a 
big important person, but I can do something to right. change the, the flow of that river that flows through society. And that's when I decided to start being more vocal, mm. using my podcast, using my radio show, using social media and speaking out. Um, do were, you miss that? Do you miss because you're not as vocal as you used to be? Do you miss being a well, mover and shaker in this societal river that flows? Well, I still, you know, go to demonstrations. Um, do you? Yeah. Do you? And I've also, I'm active in a group where <clears throat> there was a time, not so much now, but for just, you know, a few years ago, where um, the oil industry would be supporting, would be having grants for musicians. As I was kind of vocal and active in that. <clears throat> um, oh yeah, I remember that stock oil was giving out. Yeah, they gave it the stock oil stipend, yeah, you know, and yeah, they call yeah. it, you know, uh, Morndagens Helted. Tomorrow's you know, and, heroes, yeah. yeah. Tomorrow's heroes. You know, and uh, when you look at the mess we're leaving this, you know, this world in for future generations, um, it's uh, something I've been since this affected my line of work. Sure. Uh, then I, it you has. know, I, you know, and then I said, well, this is one of the things I'll talk about, even though <clears throat> I'm a hypocrite, but you know, I can see that I am How a so? hypocrite How do you because my, um, <clears throat> several things, um, I'm a, I'm a hypocrite, um, because, How so? well, a, I live in a rich country. I live, uh, I, um, you know, my carbon footprint is uh, larger than probably like 95% of the world's population. I have a privileged occupation, which, um, which makes me often, you know, I, I fly all over the country, yeah. play shows. But is that a privileged occupation? Well, you know, in many ways I've thought about it. I've thought about what can I do differently? And since I am now playing well, actually, it, it can actually go for any any musician. Maybe we should think the whole thing through again. Maybe we should, maybe we should stop touring so much. <clears throat> I mean, in the sense that why I I fly up to Finnmark, yeah, or Tromsø, yeah, or Trondheim, yeah, to play shows for kids, yeah, which is fine. But why don't I just stay in Estland where I can just play for the kids here. There's plenty of kids here. They're, you know, 80, 80, 85%. That's a, that's a problem with the kids' music here. You know, just for another walk, walk down another street here is um, is that, you know, it's 85% uh, of the kids in the age group that we should be playing for have never heard of us. Oh. Because they're, they're only going to hear about the, <laughs> once again, the classics. Back, yeah. There you go. Right. Back to the ra the regular right. radio playlist. Yeah. 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 They're going to only hear the classic, uh, you know, the, uh, I mean, why are we still singing Baba, you know, you know, it's like, yeah. Yeah. it's all that, it's all the same stuff. It's, we're not really updating the repertoire. So there's that. There's one thing. I am a hypocrite because I do fly all over the country and I do a lot of traveling and in my occupation, I am, my carbon footprint is humongous. But let, let, okay, let's address that a little bit. And I don't want to make you uncomfortable at all, but you, but, but you brought it up. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, you, you say that you could stay here in this region yeah. and just perform here. And you do have a different market in that you're playing for children and there's tons of schools in the immediate area. So it but, could be, that could be your gigging area. Yeah. But then again, would you feel, because you are, I look at music, being a musician, I look at myself in service to my listeners. Right. Same thing as a stand-up comedian. I'm in service to them. Wouldn't you feel a certain amount of guilt? And I know ego can play into this as well, but wouldn't you feel a certain amount of guilt if you are not distributing your service to a broader audience? Well, I think we should think things, you know, through differently. I mean... It's an interesting we, thing you no, brought up. No, it, really I, is. it is because of all, of all you know, <clears throat> we can, um, I think the guilt I feel for leaving the planet as we're leaving it is stronger than the guilt I will have for an, an, an audience not, you know. 
I mean, I'm You're not, looking at the sum I'm, of it. I try not to be that much of a narcissist that I yeah. that I feel that people are really missing out if they're not listening to Martin Hagforce or my, you know. So it's like <laughs> I'll be losing out. No, I'll but be I am. Out. I I'm doing what I'm doing, but I I look at myself and I look at uh, you know I don't know too much about you, but you know most most of us here in this this country are a bunch of hypocrites, yeah. and uh, so that's the one thing. I drive an old car, an old Volvo. Mm. Um, I hardly ever drive it. Really? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like I, I'm in a car. Twice. You probably have easy access to trains and I buses. I live right there downtown, also. so I yeah. do, I'm a, I ride bikes all the time. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, every you know through through the winter too. So I mean, but I do I do have veteran cars as a hobby, and at the same time, um, actively trying to undress the oil companies. <laughs> so I'm a hypocrite there. Well, I fly to the U S every once in a while to visit, uh, you know, visit family. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've, uh, but I've, you can't not keep your connection with your family. Well, is there, is there really something, are you being a little hard on yourself? Is I think it really I am, hypocritical no, I'm, not, to, I'm, not, to, I'm not being hard on myself. I, I'm not being as hard as I should be on myself. And I really? think if we, if we want to sit down and read the reports coming out of, you know, the reports and everything's going the wrong direction. It sure as heck is. You know, I mean, our... It sure as heck you know, is. Our, uh, we're not, we're just not, I don't think we're really seeming to, we're not willingly being able to, we're not doing what we should be doing. Well, it, and it, it's, it's lunacy. It's lunacy. They just can't, I think it was this, was it the CDC or maybe one of the FN or uh, the UN uh, organizations came out with a report where... And, and forgive me, I don't remember the exact numbers, but they were saying, for example, we have 25 years to fix the climate before it's irreversible. Now they're saying it's like now, like it is, like it is now. And, and so, and, and, we're, and we're not changing anything. There's a lot of talk. They're having meetings and a summit and the, you know, the G20 and this, that, and it, they're talking, but they're not doing anything. No, I mean, but, you it really know, is. and so, I mean, we can say they're not doing anything, but I'm not doing any, I mean, I'm not doing as much as I should be doing. And I, I realize that. What would you do that. different? You personally, what would you do different? What, well, let me ask you this. Maybe I'm putting you on the spot. I don't know. No, no. And I don't mean to do that. But what do you know in your honest mind? What do you know that you could do differently, but you're not? And feel free to ask me the same thing and I'll think on it and answer as good as I can. You know, this is a two way street here. It's not an interview. It's a conversation, but I yeah, do no. want to ask you that. What do you think you could do? Oh, well, creature comforts, um, I think I could uh, refrain from <clears throat> refrain from doing a lot of the traveling I'm doing. Like you said, just perform more locally, more regionally. More locally, and if I go on vacation, um, yeah. the last two summers we've dri driven up to northern Norway, you know, yeah. by car. Where'd you go up there, by the <clears> way? <throat> up to, um, we went to an island uh Last two years, we've gone to this island not too far from Tirana. There were like four houses there. And we had to drive up to Sandnesjön. Sandnesjön. Yeah. I've been through there. I yeah. love it. And uh, we park, lived in park the old, Yeah. Oh, really? Mm. Yeah. Park, we just came back down to Drummond in 2014. Uh, okay. Uh, before that, we were up in at our, at our place in Finnmark and for a while in North Finnmark? Ceyland. I don't know where that is. Uh, if you you know where Alta is, and if yeah. you go out by boat out out uh, Alta Fjorden, the first big island that you hit is oh. Ceylon, and then you have Surda, yeah, and uh, we, oh, we yeah. as we say, Hammerfest is right around the corner. Okay, yeah. From from. So Ceylon. I fly up to Hammerfest all the time to play. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. where Snoopy's family is from okay. Ceylon. Yeah, yeah, cool. Mm. Wow, that's great. That's where we, if if I had well, my, all these things. I love traveling. There's so many things. But I, you think I, you could cut back? I on wish that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, in that sense, we are all hypocrites. We yeah. all could. You know, I could have a little worse lighting and have maybe one of these spots out, for example, yeah. save a little on electricity, but yeah. the sum of that over time, <coughs> excuse me, over time yeah. would be quite meaningful. So, yeah, in a sense, we are all hypocrites. We could yeah. all be doing something better. And, you know, and like in here in Norway, where all these people with their second homes and their third homes and, and third homes and. <laughs> You know, there's just too much money going around. And, uh, <clears throat> Do you think Norway's too rich? Are, are, are we, we who live here in Norway, I'm not Norwegian, but I live here. We who live here in Norway, are we spoiled? I would say a lot of the population is, yes. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I think so. And it's all over the world. You know, it's you look at, um, you can look at the way Norway has become. Mm-hmm. It's become more like the U.S. Very uh, much in, so. in the sense that people aren't living downtown anymore. <laughs> um, you know, like this place is downtown. I live downtown in Oslo. Um, but a lot of the, the cities are now more like the U.S. being like you have suburbia, you yeah. have your part, you have your malls, yeah. and you have their parking lots around there. And for everything you do, they just like everything you do, you have to get into a car. And I'm going to, okay, I drive an old car, which, yeah, it's, it's 50 years old, but it's kind of like a hobby. 50 <clears throat> years. Did you say 50 or 15? 50. Wow. Yeah, I, I, One I, of those Volvos. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, it's so it's kind of like a hobby. Sure. But then again, it is, you know. It's, you could go it, electric. I, you could. I could go electric, but it wouldn't make any sense because for the amount of, uh, I don't drive that much. Yeah. So the, the, uh, if I go electric, um, then it, I'd have to, you know, it's all the energy that goes into making a, a completely new vehicle. Um, it's not going to really be, it's not going to probably make it, you know, a difference. Um, so there's that, um, you know, and, uh, but we're talking about electric cars, even if you're going to drive an electric car from your suburban home to a, the nearest shopping mall, that energy has to come from somewhere. Well, you're hinting on the fact that, or the, on the issue that, uh, that many say is fact that, that electrical cars are not in many ways they're worse than a good old smelly diesel vehicle. Well, they, um, they're great downtown where I live in Oslo. I just love it because um, because they don't have any, the pollution is not local. Right. Um, and they are a lot better. If, if you do drive a certain amount of miles a year, then it is definitely worth getting one. But you have to kind of look at the miles you have to drive a year. Yeah. If you're going to build an infrastructure where everything you do, you have to get into a car, that's that's not the right w- way to go about it. So we do really have to, I, I really feel that we have to change the infrastructures. Amen. Um, Snoopy so, and I have that discussion uh, often. Um, we would love to get rid of one of our cars. Yeah. But because of the type of work that we both do, we have to have two cars because there's no infrastructure to support. And maybe I'm thinking selfishly talking about being spoiled, but there's no infrastructure to support the kind of lives that we live right. professionally. Right. We have to have two cars, yeah. the bus lines, the train system. Yeah. It, just, it just doesn't fit. Yeah. And I think that's where a lot of people in the cities in Norway, maybe not so much Oslo, but other cities in Norway are in that situation where they would love to get rid of their vehicles. Yeah. But, there's no infrastructure to support that. And People that's, have to live. And unfortunately, that's going the wrong way with the pandemic because yes. a lot of the, uh, I mean, the, I took the train to come out here now, but um, <clears throat> a lot of the um, local buses are have lost so many passengers. So it's just getting worse, yeah. you know. Um, where, where are we going to be in five years? I don't know. But I mean, I so I do look upon myself and I look upon the majority of the population as being a bunch of hypocrites, but I think it's, you know, you have to... If, I, I, to you're be certain, honest, honest. You're, well, well, you're being very honest, but in that honesty, you can probably also say that you are not among the worst of the hypocrites. I mean, you're. I think the fact that we sit and discuss this, yeah. but think about the, the 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 disgustingly large amount of Americans, for example, who refuse to even talk about this because they don't see it as a problem. Yeah, and that we're not gets there. Back to we're not I, in that, that part of it, and that's that's where I kind of almost started out. What I saw was going wrong with the U.S. was the uh, lack of education <sighs> and the lack of uh, you know, and it's I don't know where did, where did where did it go wrong? I mean, where did when did when did all these stupid you know conspiracy <sighs> theories? Well, start? I have some thoughts about that. I think those conspiracy theory elements and the 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 counter intellectualism has always been there. Yeah. Um, and I don't want to say that everything that we're seeing that's bad in America is because of Trump, but I do believe that Trump's period in power freed up. It opened the floodgates. It told people that it was okay to be that person. Yeah. That, oh, Whereas yeah. before there was some social <clears throat> thing that made people conscious of their lunacy. The blatant racism Whereas now they that just came don't get, out during well, Trump. Exactly. And it's always been there, but <clears throat> he made it okay. Yeah, he did. He allowed it to 
to, to as we would say in Norwegian, blomstre, yeah. to grow, you know, to right. flourish. Right. No, it's, it's totally disgusting. I couldn't believe that he actually, it was so depressing. Really That's depressing. That's a good word for it, <clears throat> depressing. And, um, but it is depressing seeing, uh, you know, reading about all these conspiracy theories yes. and, and the way, yes. you know, the way people are looking at things and, and, uh, you can't have and, a conversation. Look at, look at, look at what, ha- what happened to, what happened to, what happened to the the Republicans? What happened to that conservative yeah. political party where they no longer yeah. even have any, they don't have any backbone anymore. No. I mean, they used to at least be like, I mean, they used to almost have a type of ideology. Well, now they're just gone. bowing they're down just, to this two-time impeached lunatic. They believe that's it, what they're they doing now. They believe in these lies. Yeah, yeah. You know, and um, well, that's I was gonna depressing. Say, yeah, and I was going to say, you can't have a, you know, I... I love to discuss politics. I love that because it can be, you know, I can learn something, but you can't have a discussion with someone who believes in all the QAnon bullshit. You can't have a discussion with someone who thinks, oh, now it's okay to be racist. You can't have, how can you, how can you debate and discuss and try and foment any kind of meaningful change with someone like that? And that's what scares me because that is what the Republican party stands for. And if we have a two party system, Mm -hmm. which that's a whole nother discussion about whether that's smart or not to have just two parties, but okay, we have a two party system and that makes us dependent on that dialogue. But well, how can also, you have dialogue? Yeah, you how have can to, you? You have to look pre Trump as well. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I mentioned, you know, yeah. stuff that goes way back, but <clears throat> you also have to look at the um, axis of evil where they started, uh, you know, where, the, where Bush started speaking in terms of it's the a heck cruci- of a label to put on <clears throat> a big chunk of the world the yes. axis of evil axis of evil and that's and that and you're going back to the i mean you're going back to uh, you know the old crusades yes you're going you're going back and you're and uh, he actually used that term crusades we're on yeah. a crusade yeah. for justice yeah which is total absolute crap oh, it's, like, oh it's my so God, GW. absolute crap and oh. that has like you know basically the brotherly love and the uh, what good, you know, the, the good things in almost all religions yeah. um, is sitting in the back seat, And it's just, you know, it's just like, or it's just like there is a, a film around, a film around a bunch of lies, you know, it's yeah. just, yeah. so it's kind of depressing. Well, and, and, you know, to, to wrap all of that up with what we're saying about how bad things are in the world yeah. in general, but specifically in the United States, again, that is what pushed me to being more vocal and more <clears throat> active and using yeah. my platform to touch on the, not necessarily the political things, but the social political yeah. things. Yeah. Because of my kids. Right. You know, we're here in Norway, but they are half American and maybe one day they want to go live there. So if I can be vocal or give my microphone to somebody who can speak on it intelligently so that things may be better for my kids if they want to go there. And I still have family there. Yeah. You know, Um, daughter, grandkids, mom, sister. Yeah. You know, they're still there. So I still care. And, um, yeah, I, I guess I, I guess I felt like an idiot for not using a platform to speak on it. So here for the last two or three, four years, I'd say I've been as vocal as I can be. That's good. Proudly so. Yeah. Shut up, yeah. you musician. Just play. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah Sorry, right, I'm, right, not gonna, right, I'm not going right, to do it. Yeah, I'm not going right. to do. It. I'll play, but I'm going to talk as well. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm not it's, gonna, it's important. Um, how much time do you have? We've been talking an hour and twenty minutes. Oh. How long can I keep you here? Whoa. I'm ready to keep rolling, man. But how much time do you have? <coughs> Let's do another ten fifteen. Let me ask you this then, um, uh, I, and I like to do this. It's kind of cliche, but I like to do it because it teaches me something every mm-hmm. time I do this. Uh, I want to say uh, three words, and I want you to finish the sentence. Just one sentence. Okay. Martin Hogfush is a hypocrite. <laughs> 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 no, no, really? Okay, no. Tell me about okay, that. Okay, <laughs> I'm a who? I, okay, uh, who I? Who? Who am I? Martin Hopkins is. I'm a. Um, I'm a songwriter, musician, father, grandfather, and I try to be a human. You try, I try to, to be, be a human. human. I try yeah. to be human. So and and uh, I try not to. You know, if I guess I'm an emotional person. And uh, you most try, certainly try, are. I try and try and be, I try and be compassionate. Um, you most certainly are. So, but I, I know, can say that I've seen yeah, it in you. Yeah. I've seen it in your lyrics. I've seen it when you've been on, on uh, television and whatnot. Uh, and I see it here. 
I get this. This might sound stupid and sappy, but I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you this. Um, and this is something I talk with Snoopy about all the time. There's some people, and usually it's a female, mm. who, when I'm around them, when I speak with them, when I look in their eyes, I just get this feeling of, that's a good person. That person cares. And usually it's a woman. But I get that with you. You're a guy. You, you, That's because I have my mother's eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, mom. No, but but no. you, I don't. I don't get the impression. I think I said it earlier that you don't put any fluff in your lyrics. I don't think you put much fluff in your life. Uh, and I'm not saying you're a serious person. You know, you know, you know how to have fun. You've told a ton of jokes. You know, before we went on the mic, uh, you know how to have fun. But but you you make your time count. Yeah, well, I, is that a good? Is that a? Is that well, you? I'm so. I have. I'm not so, saying you're. A, you're. You got a stick up your ass, and you don't know how yeah, to have fun. Yeah, I'm I not have, saying that. No, but you, I you, have so many faults. It's unbelievable. Sure you but do. I think you know. Nobody's perfect. People, no, no, people have those. But I do. I do. Um, you have an yeah, inherent I, I, I goodness. Try, try, you have a warm be, goodness try, in you. I can see it. I, I can try, feel I it. I try and be. Yeah, I do. You do. I, I do yeah. get. Um, I think I do. I think you do too. I. But you know, it's like, I, it's, it's very difficult. I don't, I'm, you know, I'm, I don't. You really embarrass? Like, are you embarrassed? Did I embarrass yeah, you? A little bit because I'm. Well, good. Uh, I'm, I'm totally really good. I'm not really good with. Um, I'm always slightly uncomfortable with praise. That could be the. Nor Norway has kind of soaked into your soul. Norwegians do not take compliments very well at all. I, I they just don't. No, I don't know because that's I a think, quite quite a generalization, oh, really? but it's okay. True. I think okay. Norwegians get uh, th almost visibly squirm when, when I put praise on them. Okay. That's, I never realized that was a Norwegian trait. It is. It really okay. is. It really yeah. is? Okay. Yeah. I always felt, uh, Jantelöven. I, I, I always, Jantelöven. Oh, no, no, That's no. an aspect oh, really? of it. Think that? Was, yeah. Okay. Because I, I really haven't seen so much of, you know, Jantelöven seems to be, to me, it seems, I think that's more, wasn't that more like envy? And well, Yanto was like, don't think I you are see, better. Than, don't think you're. Oh well, no, no. I, 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 I think let me put it to you I like this. I see now. Excuse me, but I see now. So, I mean, there's so much boasting and there's so much self righteousness, yeah. and where people aren't. I don't know. You have to be willing to see your own shortcomings. Well, yeah, but see, but here's what's so cool about you. You know, you acknowledge your shortcoming. You call yourself a hypocrite. Right. Uh, but you also spoke for a long time about your musical and songwriting accomplishments. And you did it with ease. You did it with grace. It was far from boasting. You were just telling your story. So you have that, I call it a comfortable and acceptable duality. Yeah. You're quite humble, but you're also quite aware of your accomplishments and abilities. And yes, that's a rare, you, well, 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 let me finish. But, and, and that's a rare thing to find in a, in a Norwegian. That's very rare. But then your Norwegian is came very much to the forefront when I started complimenting you. You yeah, almost visibly you, squirmed. You yes, blushed. Because, because the way you complimented me, John, was that you, you started you you started you know talking about how you could see in my eyes that I was you know a passionate person yeah, or yeah. I probably got the words wrong already but that's our memory yeah but that's okay working. to paraphrase yeah, but yeah, that's yeah. yeah yeah and that is so personal yeah. and I but while I sitting here and I know all my shortcomings and all the you know and all all the Stuff I have done and stuff I have said. But that speaks to the goodness that I am addressing, the goodness that okay. I see in you. Right. The fact that you feel that, that you're like, oh my gosh. You're probably thinking, yeah, thanks, John, but oh my gosh, if you only knew. But that speaks to your goodness. You, right. there's no, I don't see an ounce of hubris in you. I don't see an ounce of arrogance. But at the same time, you are very sure of yourself. But then... The other aspect comes forward when I vocalize yes, pretty this, much, I'm per, pretty much paraphrasing. In other words, I'm acknowledging the very things that you spoke about, about your career. Well, they, it made you there is an embarrassing element in it, John, because yeah. that, because you and I are sitting in this room yeah. in your studio, yeah. but we have microphones in front of us. We have a TV camera over there yeah. and, um, so I'm aware of an audience yeah. and 
<laughs> that being publicized the way you said it now, I found it slightly embarrassing. I think it was a, wow. a good question, but I, I, but that's probably why I squirmed because you know I just oh jeez man you know yeah <laughs> the, he really doesn't know what an asshole is sitting over here <laughs> on, the, on the sofa. Wait till I get him back here next time, then I'm going to be yelling at him for being the jerk that he really is. No. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, I I don't know I. And, and I didn't mean to make you uh, to make you uncomfortable. It didn't but, bother but I, me one one bit. But that's, I believe that's, I, I just I tried believe, to answer the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I I, I believe in telling people because I don't th I feel that there is far from enough goodness in this world. Uh, that is why I love doing my program. I love getting people in, whether it's Joe Blow on the street who I bumped into and we had a five minute conversation and I think there's something interesting about him. I'll invite that, and I have invited that person in to be on my show or whether it's someone with celebrity status or whether it's a fellow musician or somebody that I used to work with. I love getting people in here and being as real as possible and exposing the goodness that people have. Right. Because again, I don't think there's enough of it in the world. Right. Um, um, I'm not going to say forgive me for exposing your goodness, no, but that's no. what I wanted to do is dig into the, 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 like I say, I've been, um, uh, uh, you know, you can see I'm not some kind of psycho, but I have been a fan of yours for 20 years. Right. And I wanted to confirm, I guess, <laughs> not the image that I had of you, but I just, I, I wanted to bring my curiosity about you to the forefront, let you know about it and then talk about it. And then some of my impression of it. And that is my impression. I can see the goodness. I can see the warmth in you. You're not perfect. Far from it. There's what do you mean? <laughs> well, I've probably done things that would, but see, we all change, right? We right. all change. And right. part of that change can be painful. And that pain comes from the stupid things that we do in life. So everybody has that. Well, I just have to be aware of your, um, I guess, uh, I guess you have Two things. You, one, on the one side, you count your blessings, but you also yes. have to be aware of your shortcomings. You have to, and, that's um, honesty. You have to be honest and with you have yourself. To, you have to and strive to be better. Let's strive to be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One more thing I want to ask you uh, before we before we wind this up. Uh, again, I have people on my show, people who inspire me, people I'm curious about, people who motivate me. You fit all of those things. Uh, is there something that you can say now uh, that I and my listeners and viewers can carry with us to lift us up a little bit higher to maybe make the next hour or so after having had this conversation be a little bit better on our path through life. Well, what can you say? Well, since you're a musician, I would say, um, whatever you do, whatever songs you write and whatever music you make, um, Make something that you enjoy playing, that you yourself enjoy playing, and you can free yourself from other people's expectations when you do stuff. So, and for anyone else, is just basically be yourself. You know, it's like be yourself and uh, be try and be unique and uh, try and try and find have your own voice and and be vocal and yeah. talk about things and say, you know, just question things you hear, question yeah. things, you know, question what, what's going on, what, what's going on around there, you know, so around you, I guess. Uh, so basically, is, yeah, it's like, don't be timid, but yeah. don't be, don't be, don't be timid, but don't be violent. Ah, yes. You know, There's you know? a balance there. Yeah. You don't know? be timid, but don't be uh, uh, and, and, yeah, aggressive. And, and listen. Yeah, and yeah. listen. And listen. listen. And listen. I was, a, I was a little timid about asking you to be on the show. Yeah. I was. Yeah. But I told Snoopy, I just asked and he said yes. So what was there to be... Yeah. What was there to be timid about? Right, right. <laughs> and if you right. would have said no, then okay. And I yeah. just move on yeah. and wait for the next album. And, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Listen, um, oh, one more thing. Uh, who can you, who would you suggest, who would you like to see in this setting, in this forum, so that you could maybe learn something? Who, who do you want me to tell they have something warm behind their eyes? 
You mentioned Jeff Was. Um, um, yeah, Jeff Was. Jeff Was. Yeah, yeah. Is that as, the, as, as a uh, musician? Yeah. Uh, you he's sticking he, with that. Yeah, I, I, yeah? I could stick with that. Yeah. Um, if you, are you, do you want a musician? Sure. Why not? Doesn't have to be. Okay. I did ask Lars Holvard a long time ago, oh, yeah. and he okay. said yes, but then he got busy. Okay. <laughs> so I haven't heard anything back from him. Um, well, the thing is, you want to. Is it, you have to find you just find someone? I, I guess you. On the one hand, you want somebody who'll talk about themselves, but that doesn't really. You don't really want somebody who's just trying to sell themselves. Yeah, I want somebody who's in for the conversation. And see, and I have a lot of people lined up to come on, but I always feel like I'm missing something. So that's why I ask my guests now, who do you think would be somebody good to have on? And then I kind of branch off of my my little narrow tunnel vision of about, about who I'd like to have on. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I get that golden discovery because someone suggested them and I never would have thought, I never would have thought a Jeff Watson. I, yeah. I, I, well, I know another, who he is, but I never would have thought of asking him a, to be on. There's a, there's a lady I like uh, yeah. called, um, called Sig Nirusta. Sig Nirusta. Yeah. Her, her mother's Canadian yeah. and her, her father's from up in there, Elvidum. Yeah. And she's uh, she's kind of a hot. Um, she's doing very well as a uh, as a songwriter now, and uh, she's a very enjoyable person. Yeah. I'm sure you'd enjoy having her on your show. I think I'll, I think I'll get in touch with her. Very smart. I'll say Mark Longford said, "You yeah. have to do this." Yeah. <laughs> I'll put the blame on you. Yeah. Listen, Martin. Uh, I've enjoyed this. I you feel can. like I'm a better person now for having had this conversation with you. Um, this, well, you've told me things about myself. I didn't know, but now I know okay. you believe me though. Don't you, you believe me when I yeah, told well, you these yeah, things I about do believe you. you. Um, um, it, uh, food for thought. Yeah. You know, and, and I, and <clears throat> I'm not dependent on people's feedback, but I certainly take it in and digest it. Yeah. So digest what I said okay. about the, the, the inherent goodness in you. You, you, you may be a jerk from time to time. We all are, but inherently, you're good. You're warm. I feel it. I know it. Thank you. You're, you're Thank welcome, you. Martin. Made me feel comfortable. Everybody, I want you guys to check out Martin Hogforsh's- Oh, there's uh, the camera. Yeah, right there. I was wondering where that camera was. Yeah. I haven't even been looking at the camera. Yeah, but that's good. You yeah. just for, kind yeah. of forget it's there. Yeah. We're just talking. Yeah. But I My want camera. everybody to check out his music, Martin Hogforsh. He's got decades. How many years have you been at it? Three decades. Yeah. Three decades worth of music. And it's good stuff. Guaranteed. Check it out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye now.